Hi, I'm Charisma Price. I'm a professor here. I'm a pro poetry professor in the English department at Tulane University. Very, very happy to have these wonderful poets here today. Uh, the title of the panel is called Poetry Today, Writing in the Modern World. We're going to start the panel off. I'm going to introduce each poet, and then they're going to read a poem. So the order will be Jessica, Raymond, and Cynthia. So, Jessica Abugatis is the author of Strip, winner of the 2020 Atel Adnan Poetry Prize, selected by Fadi Joa and Hayan Sharara. Her poems have appeared or, or are forthcoming in Poetry, Guernica, Los Angeles Review of Books, The Yale Review, and elsewhere. So, would you like to start us off with a poem? I'm going to read the first poem in my book. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Dinner Party. At the Chicago home of two of the film's well-to-do backers, Irish Catholics, there was talk of the baby their daughter had adopted from Uzbekistan, the trauma of not being held. There are not enough women in the orphanages to hold all the babies, so they put them in one crib. The night outside was black, and I felt the chill inside my womb. There was a closet to hang our coats, the director, absent from the table, is tense when his wife is on set. The hostess took our coats. They had a white dog, four feet tall, with a coat you could find on a Bergdorf floor. The Bulgarian washed vegetables barefoot. When we embraced, she smelled my perfume. Look how beautiful your woman is, a remark about my collarbones. There was talk about filmmaking in occupied Palestine. The trained fighters, hired for security, ran off, leaving the actors in combat. They had to push the car through the desert. The meal was decadent and the hostess pleasant. There were collard greens, corn, a roast. The hostess said they wanted an American feast, and Jack, with his white beard and iridescent teeth at the head of the table. The Palestinian went out into the frost to smoke, stepped in the tundra dog's shit. There was talk about the gentrification of East Side Los Angeles, the finest sushi in Little Tokyo. The cinematographer requested roasted vegetables. A rhubarb pie was served. There was a large bowl of tropical fruit. The wooded suburbs of Chicago are so dark you could die if a deer runs in front of your car. The house was recently remodeled. The Bulgarian actress, pretty without makeup, the director was off on a marital dilemma. All the actors had spouses. Instructions how to kiss, blocking can make anyone fall in love. There was talk about the promise of the young director who sat beside me. There were three Palestinians, two Irish, the Bulgarian. The cinematographer was Chinese American, the AD was white and gay. The house was so big I got lost in the powder room. It had been a tough night on set. The scene called for nudity. An intimacy coach was brought on set. The director is having marital problems. There aren't enough women to hold the babies. A letter arrived, and I saw him smell it. We smoke in frost and step in shit. The Akita is angelic. There was talk about the rental market, a stucco Mediterranean true to the golden age of 1920s Hollywood. He's a promising young man who directs me. I am a decent woman. I have scandalized a few. Everyone fell silent. The rhubarb pie was served too hot. The hostess was pleasant. There was a coat room and a remark about my collarbones, a decadent American feast. The Palestinian fought off three men, or so he says. Being held is a trauma. One crib held all the babies in Uzbekistan. When we embraced, she smelled tropical. Nudity was called for. The Palestinian was humiliated. A car could kill you in the dark, not while your wife is on set washed face and barefoot. It had been a tough night. We held hands the whole way up the cobbled path. Thank you. So up next we have Raymond Antrobus. Raymond Antrobus was born in London, Hackney, to an English mother and Jamaican father. He's the author of Shapes and Disfigurements, Burning Eye, 2020, uh, 2012, To Sweet and Bitter, by Outspoken Press in 2017, The Perseverance by Penned in the Margins in Tin House in 2018, 
All the Names Given by Pic Picador and Tin House, and Signs Music by Picador and Tin House. You have a lot of books. You are a writing machine. Um, yeah, you can. Yeah, sweet. You can sweet. Hello, everyone. Hi, good to be here. Uh, I'm kind of in another time zone at the moment, but um, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna read a poem uh, called Two Guns in the Sky" for Daniel Harris, and it shows a story about uh, when I was living in New York. Uh, I, I saw this this CNN news article about this man, Daniel Harris, who lost his life uh, needlessly, um, and I felt like you know the idea that when you write a poem about something, it stays news. It's news that's not news. It's news that stays news. Um, and I feel like there's something in this story that speaks to the kind of dangers that we're all in if we keep failing to understand each other. Um, so yeah, we can, we can speak more about that. Um, I, in the UK, I, I, uh, I went to a, a deaf school, so I speak uh, a British Sign Language, which is completely different to American Sign Language. It's completely different. The alphabet, everything, you're, you're all on one hand, we're on two hands. So I, I use some sign with my poems but if you speak ASL, you're going to be seeing, you're going to be like, what is that? Pro probably, unless you speak British Sign Language. Two Guns in the Sky for Daniel Harris. When Daniel Harris stepped out of his car, the police officer was waiting, gun raised. I used the past tense, but this is irrelevant in Daniel's language, which is sign. Sign has no future or past tense. It is a present language. You are never more present than when a gun is pointed at you. What language says this if not sign? But the police officer saw hands waving in the air, fired, and Daniel dropped his hands, his chest bleeding out to the concrete, meters from his home. And I'm in New York Coffee House reading this news on my phone when a black policewoman walks in, two guns on her hips, my friend, next to me, reading the comment section, Black Lives Matter. Now what could we sign or say out loud when the last word I learned in American Sign Language was alive, alive. Both thumbs pointing at your lower abdominal, index fingers pointing up like two guns in the sky. Thank you, Raymond. And last but not least, we have Cynthia Manick. She's the author of No Sweet Without Brine by Amistad, published in 2023, which received five stars from Roxane Gay, editor of The Future of Black, Afrofuturism, Black Comics, and Superhero Poetry, winner of the Lasco Prize in Collected Poetry, and author of Blue Hallelujahs. She's received fellowships from Kavi Khanum, Hedgebrook, McDowell, for 10 years, she curated Soul Sister Review, a quarterly reading series that promoted poetry as storytelling and featured emerging poets, poet laureates, and Pulitzer Prize winners. She lives in Brooklyn, New York, but travels widely for poetry. Thank you. I'm going to read Litany for My Fears and Questions after Audre Lord. For those of us getting used to writing poems for the dead, for the dead, for rainbows without a streak of black, for Gabara daisies that wilt quickly, for silence so quiet you tilt like earth axis, like that day in September when the phones rang and rang and rang, and you learn that charred wood is stronger than most barks. Does love taste like sweet grass? Can I be mad as love as sweet grass? Does jump in the blood mean I'm having a heart attack? a heartbreak, or a heart's fury between dawns? Can a mouth be starved for the sun? How many fibroids is too many? Can I take three leads instead of two? For those of us expected to beautify what's hemmed in, latest numbers in our zip codes, questions on God, particles, boredom, I mean the town crier, I mean our mothers, glue to the phone to lay names of the sick, they fall like M dashes or brittle teeth. When will scientists name this new emotion? Is it wrong to want a storm named after you? 
Can a phone call be good news? News so jubilant that our lungs expound six liters of air. Let this be the last time we mourn or dream of a beast or a beach full of a hundred brown turtles retracted in their shells. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm checking the timer, so Mm -hmm. I'm going to get into some questions, and then at the end, we'll have a few minutes for audience Q&A if you have any questions, so keep that in mind. Um, The first question I'm going to ask, what's been bringing you joy lately? I ask my students this. I make them do, like, adult show-and-tell projects. What's been bringing you joy or wonder recently? Okay, they'll look at me. like, we don't know about joy. What is joy? We're poets. (laughs) You know, honestly, I well, right now I just had a po' boy like yesterday, so that brought yeah. me a lot of joy. Um, I want to say food. I want to say mm-hmm. conversations with people like you guys on this book tour. I'm meeting people who I don't know, but I instantly feel like kin. Um, I want to say uh, sun when it's also raining. Yeah, welcome to New Orleans. Yeah, and I want to say. Um, YouTube. <laughs> For some reason, I'm going. I'm in the YouTube like thing right now where I'm watching clips from the New Girl. <laughs> Just watching clips that I like, and um, puppies taking baths. Puppies taking baths. Have you ever watched puppies taking baths on YouTube? It's so relaxing. <laughs> and so I've been doing that too. <laughs> yeah, I think um, the past few months have been a particularly challenging time to feel joy, considering. Um, just a tremendous loss of human life uh, mm-hmm. and having to ex- kind of re-experience my parents' traumas through that uh, mm-hmm. as a Palestinian living in diaspora. Um, so I think it's important to acknowledge that as we sit here safely that mm-hmm. um, there are a lot of human beings endangered. And um, I think that what has brought me joy is just stopping to smell the roses the beautiful flowers that are blooming in New Orleans and um, just connecting and being with the people that I'm with in the moment that we're in, mm-hmm. just being right here. Yeah, um, many things. I'm, 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 a, I'm a parent. My son is two years old. Um, and that's been its own challenge and its own joy and its own beautiful thing. Um, Likewise, it's been difficult, like to, uh, you know, thinking, finding the language to describe this current moment for, for, for to a child even who, mm. who's going to be seeing these these things. And I've been thinking a lot about, uh, yeah, how to do that and what our responsibility is as um, as poets. Mm-hmm. Um, but it has been joyful to find, uh, like you said, th- those shared spaces where people are united in rage mm-hmm. as well as joy. Um, I know I've shared many spaces like that over the past few months around Europe as well. as It was in Ireland recently. Um, yeah, so like I, I'm thinking so much about this idea of freedom as well, and the, the freedom to have joy, and that uh, Angela Davis quote, you know, uh, freedom is always a struggle, mm-hmm. um, which is not the question, but it's like it's such a hard thing to grapple with, no, and I'm still I'm answer. still working that out, you know. Um, but honestly, I love being a dad, <laughs> and my son is 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 really, he's given me a lot of life. I'm very grateful for him. He's a, he's a real kind of um, grounding uh, thing for me, and I'm writing poems about him, so like what Cynthia just said, like the, when the poems come, there's a buoyancy in that. Cool, thank you, thank you for sharing. Um, since we are, uh, the title of this panel is called Poetry in the Modern World, and speaking about both the joys and the horrors of what's occurring in the world, a lot of, in all three of your writings, you incorporate memory and image. Mm. And this is a question for everyone, but specifically in the intro of your book, um, there was the um, essay where it talks about the idea of repetition and how repetition in memory, repetition isn't just repeating the same thing and it's not about 
just the passage of time, but how time passes through you. Mm. And as poets, we, depending on the moment we tend to linger, we often try to figure out what's the right word, the right words to say. Mm -hmm. And in all three of your works, um, you incorporate a lot of image and whether it's talking about family, whether it's talking about borders versus borderlessness and how often as a poet I find that my poems tend to be much smarter than me as the poet mm. and how they allow us to be able to exist in this body but also in a sense be limitless mm. so I wanted to know when it comes to imagery I guess can you speak on like your personal relationship between poetry imagery and form and do you, when you're writing, do you start with an image? Do you start with a form? Do you start with a question? What's your crafting process like? And how do you feel that when you say, this is what I want to say, um, how do you decide whether it's a sound, an image, or a metaphor? I love this question, Charisma. <laughs> I think repetition is a form of love because when you love, you repeat and you repeat and every, every time there's a repetition, there's a different flourish on it. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think I start with musicality and I start with sound and voice is the most important thing that I write through. Um, and just speaking of that musicality and sound in classic Arabic music, um, they'll repeat, they'll sing the same line over and over and over and over again. And each time because of the inflection on it, the meaning is different. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that is one way that I can enter into a memory or enter into deeper into a memory is through that sound and repetition. Mm. I want to read a poem. Right. I want to read a poem. Go for it. It's called I Try to Imagine Them Smitten. I've never seen my parents kiss or try to be the silver dollar in each other's pockets. In one photo... Though on a green love seat, the plastic cover looks sweaty to touch. Dad is standing on the side, afro sheen bright as paint, mouth curved to sing something alive. My mom is seated, brown legs crossed and bare. Clasping hands, they hold close those disappearing things. Slow dancing in Marvin's, mercy, mercy me. A mumbling river, a blue patchwork quilt with its ends ragged to touch, and a bowl of honeydew melon, a safer midnight when the kids are asleep. Did it ever touch like bath water on ankles? A whisper thought so hot only the dust could hear. I try to imagine them smitten, past the slammed doors, past the obsidian quiet, to side glances and half tones. But maybe it only happened once in a South Carolina groove where only the moon could see. Hmm. So when I think of memory and I think of family, I think of music. That's when I first, that's when music to me really signifies, oh, I remember I heard this song, I remember I saw this song when this person died. It's usually a musical. And after that, it's usually me answering, asking a question. Hmm. Like, what's happening in the world? Why, where's the stars being around? I can't see them. You know, my mom and dad were together. What did that love look like? What did the first love look like? You know, when it was all passionate and it's like you just can't wait to see them and how they are now. Like, what was that journey like? I don't know, but I can imagine. Mm. That's how the poems end up coming out of me as imaginings. I always think that poets are anthropologists. We really tell, try to tell a story behind the story behind the story. Mm -hmm. And so I think I try to do that in my work. Mm. Yeah, I love that. Um, I'm going to... I'm going to do a thing and read a poem because while I've been watching um, my little one like, like gra grapple with language, I've been, I've been teaching him to sign, so sign is his first language now. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote a poem about that um, because there's so much repetition. Even in, you know, repetition isn't just a spoken word or a written word, it could also be a signed uh, word. Mm -hmm. uh, the first word my son signed was music. Both hands, fingers, conducting music for everything, even hunger. Open mouth for the choo-choo, spoon squealing, mm, music. <laughs> We'd play a record while he ate music, when he wanted milk, so I'd pour and hum a lullaby, or I just don't know by Bill Withers, because it's okay not to know what I want, and I want him to know that. 
Music is wiping the table after the plates. Music is fill my forehead for fever. Is whatever occurs in the center of the body, whatever makes arms raise up, up. The second word my son signed was bird. Beaked finger to thumb, bird for everything outside, window, sky, tree, roof, chimney, aerial, airplane, <laughs> birds. I saw I'd given him a sign name. Fingers to eyes, rising from thumbs, wide eye, meaning watchful of the earth in three different roots, Hebrew, Arabic, Latin. I love how he clings to my shoulders and turns his head to point at the soft body of a caterpillar sliding across the counter and signs music. That is so cute. I love that. And I love that you all responded with music because I too love music. And in my book, I write a lot of persona poems about musicians. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just talking to a group of high school students this morning about you were saying how the inflection changes. I was talking to them. First of all, I asked them if they knew who James Brown was because some of them don't. They're, they're very, you know. But there's a Fix song. Fix their lives. Fix their lives. They got to get no James Brown. Look, some of them were born in 2005. <laughs> I was like, do you know who James Brown is? But the song, Please, it's like he's repeating please, but each time yeah, it's a different type yeah. of plead. Mm -hmm. So that inflection really changes it. And with repetition, especially with um, my book as well, when it comes to that repetition, it's repeating it so that it it's itself, but if this makes sense, it becomes its own new like definition for itself. It changes each time. So I love that we all love music. Um, so I want to talk about as poets, we observe a lot. And you have to really be an active listener to be a poet and be an active watcher. So I also I want to talk about the persona, the persona and observation. All of you also have persona poems or perso uh, poems where you, you are not the I. And usually with poetry, there's never one singular I. There's mm -hmm. always a collective I. Like if we all went home and wrote a poem about this panel, it's all gonna be different poems because we all have different voices. So that type That's of an collective assignment. I. That's an assignment right yeah. now. Yeah, <laughs> write about this. Right. <laughs> so with my own writing, I try to be really responsible with my empathy because you, know, you might have this urge to write about something. That doesn't mean you always should. But um, because there is this collective I, could you discuss the relationship between observation and empathy? Um, if, hmm. Or I could rephrase that um, and say, oh wait, maybe I can't rephrase it. But um, how do you navigate that responsibility? Because I know some people, in, in particular when we're thinking about modern poetry and persona, some people think it's ethical, some people think it's unethical, some people think that um, persona is overstepping a boundary. Mm -hmm. A lot of poets think that it's to get to the truth because poetry is not nonfiction. And when you are writing a poem, it's, it's emotionally true. It doesn't always have to be factually true. Mm -hmm. So I guess the deeper question is observance and truth. How do you navigate that? How do you um, write that? And if you want to touch on the ethicalness of it. Yeah, could I, uh, <laughs> yeah, Go for it. it's tricky. Um, so the mother of my child is from New Orleans, so I lived here for like six months, mm -hmm. and I did this thing. I don't know how many people here uh, have come to New Orleans from the outside, but I'm making a confession, and I apologize. <laughs> but I wrote like these New Orleans poems, which were awful. <laughs> they were so bad. <laughs> but the thing is, if I'm honest, when I was writing them, I thought they were good. And... Um, a great poet, one of uh, um, me and Charisma were at CarbyCon together with uh, Robin Cross Lewis, you know, the yes, poet lawyer of LA, but has all of these deep roots in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And uh, Robin Cross Lewis um, asked me to, uh, we were doing a reading together. She said, Can I see the poems you're going to read? Because she knew that I'd been in New Orleans. Oh, so no. it's almost like she was giving me it's a check. It's a trap. <laughs> it was a trap, but I'm so grateful for it. So I sent her these poems, and I didn't hear anything from her for two days. Um, and she had the, to think about it. You know, <laughs> she, she's like, all right, let me think how, how, how to respond to this. To this. <laughs> and there were poems in there that were persona poems that were like, 
overheard things that I'd heard in New Orleans, different, um, and uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm not even going to go into any of the language I used, but I would say that Robin Cross Lewis wrote me a, a, a very graceful, eloquent, considered, beautiful essay of a response um, about that, actually, about the kind of mm. tropes and dangers of the um, kind of like, you know, the, the question being like, do you really know what you're talking about? Do you really understand what you're speaking to and from? Mm -hmm. And um, I have forever taken that kind of uh, idea with me. Um, and, and, and sometimes I get suspicious of that initial like mm -hmm. rush of inspiration, if you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like even now on the way here, I was looking at the trees, the, the willow tree, and it's just all of these kind of feelings. And I was like, I don't know if it's my place to write about these trees. I could write about my own response to them, but I, yeah, it's, it, it made me think more about how to situate mm -hmm. my voice and where I can be most uh, I don't know, uh, where, I have the mo where I have the most authority, I'm not sure. I'm kind of like, I'm saying that I'm still grappling with this. I have no answer to it. I just wanted to yeah. kind of bring that uh, to, 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 this, to this panel. Because, yeah, yeah, I don't know. It's definitely a, a gray area, but as, I think as a poet, you walk around, you eavesdrop, you live, and then you automatically respond. Now, that first poem, you think it's going to be brilliant. It's not. <laughs> but the first poem you write about it, it's not going to be brilliant. Sleep on it, sleep on it two, three days, and then bring it back up. Okay, where's the craft in this poem? Um, what perspective am I giving this poem in? Am I writing about me seeing this area? Am I writing about the area itself? And if so, what does that mean? So as a writer, you should write anything you want. You should get it out of you because the poem is asking you to do something. But then as a good writer, you're thinking about craft, you're thinking about what do these words mean, or all mean, mean different levels. Mm. And where are you, like... Where, where are you in that level? Yeah. And many, sometimes the poems I write, they never see the light of day. I was like, oh, this was a reaction to something. A guy broke up with me. Okay, this is crap. <laughs> but another poem I write, it's about the same instance, where I was like, well, this is why I wrote it. I know why I wrote it. I know where it's coming from. I see my heart in it, and I see the craft. I see the word choice. I'm doing, each line has three bumps. I mean, I can see it from a class level, I can see it from a state level, a university level, oh, bam, this poem is hot. So, you know, you think about it that way. You sort of go through your levels where this poem is going to be and where it lands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I appreciate a lot of the points that were raised about, I think it matters how close that uh, voice that you're taking on is to you. There are a handful of poems in my book that are in the voice of my grandmother. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't call them persona poems though because mm -hmm. um, I'm writing it down as it was told to me. Mm -hmm. And so- Like dictation. I, That's Ken. I, yeah. I think I'm, I'm trying to capture my grandmother's stories so that I can remember how she told them to me. Mm -hmm. And so uh, in it, I think there's, a, there's a, a fine line between persona or not and I ended up changing the titles to some of the poems to She Tells Me About. And I think mm -hmm. that that she makes it a third person instead of a persona. Mm -hmm. um, because I'm just writing it as I heard it, but I'm not embodying her. I understand. Yeah, thank you. Those were wonderful responses. You sound surprised. No, I... <laughs> <laughs> No, I've been thinking of as someone who, when I first started writing poems, I was afraid of anybody knowing anything about me. So yeah, I used too. to write persona <laughs> poems. And then... Can, I, can I ask you, Charisma, when you, Charisma came to London, I mean, met off and read to the library yeah. stuff. Did you write any poems about London? Yes. Are yeah. they, are are they, they good? good Do you want to send them to me? <laughs> yeah, I'll send them to you. <laughs> it's, about, it's, so, it's about being on the train. Mm. The train ride from... The you? From no 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 like a train train like from going from Manchester coming into London. Oh, okay, yeah. But it involves music as well. Nice. nice. Um, it's about there are flowers and stuff in it too. So, yes. <laughs> um, so, my next question. Uh, often, you know, as a professor, I teach I teach an intro creative writing class and then I teach an advanced poetry workshop and often in the intro class I have them read an essay called Why I Write by Reginald Shepard. So Reginald Shepard he has this very detailed essay about 
why he writes, what he thinks his writing can achieve and uncover. And he starts as one of the best lines I've ever heard in an essay. I think it's either the first or the second line. And he goes, I write because the fact of my future death offends me. And I'm like, okay, well, okay. Can't get anything from that. So I often ask them after we discuss the essay in class, I'm like, how do you feel about his attempts to capture beauty? Um, you know, everything is temporary. And he talks about uh, writing, whether it's achievable or not, an attempt at saving, saving his mother's memory who had passed or saving pieces of himself. So, I mean, this is a big, vague question, but you know, do you think writing can save? And if so, who or what? Um, if that is too big of a question, um, what are some things you think, what are some things or I guess people you think you're writing towards? Maybe influences? Someone once asked, who are you writing for or against? And I was like, ooh, against. <laughs> um, we all have our literary family trees, so. I guess it's more of a question about lineage. Do you think writing can save? And also, what are you trying to write towards in your own work personally? Don't look at me again, you guys. <laughs> I went first last time. So. I can, I, you want me to give an answer for myself <laughs> while you think? I think it can save. Um, I don't think it can save fully. I think... The writer, the poet Hanifa Durkeeb said this, so I'm gonna take this from him, but I agree with it. He says that he doesn't think writing can always save, but he thinks it can help examine a wound. And I really mm -hmm. feel like the act of um, examining something and having a new lens on it, whether or not it can save the person, it can give you a, a, a more specific name for a thing. Mm -hmm. um, for me personally, I feel like as someone born and raised here, I am trying to write uh, I'm trying to be more vulnerable in my work. Mm -hmm. um, I was talking to a friend recently, and I felt like I was vulnerable. In my, I had a book that came out last year, and I was I showed her a new poem, and she was like, "In your first book, you were so like clever, and of course you were vulnerable, but you're like very sneaky with it. And here, you're very like knife in the heart." So she says, "I feel like you're getting towards." an extra sense of vulnerability. So I feel like I'm writing more towards vulnerability, writing towards more about um, ecology. I've been writing a lot of nature poems and um, my relationship to New Orleans, especially as someone who has experienced Katrina. And when I think about nature, it's not always pleasant. Like mm -hmm. pastoral poems are about people, you know, lying in a hammock mm -hmm. in the sun. And to me, nature hasn't, I feel, hasn't always been the kindest to me, but I also feel as humans, we haven't been most kind to it. So, mm. yeah. I like that. Can I, I think I know how to respond. I'm just gonna read a poem. Go for it. Uh, so this is a poem called For Time I'm Given. It's a friend of mine who I went to school with. Again, I went to uh, a deaf school in London. Tyrone was one of my good friends, an amazing football player. Uh, and he, uh, I, I lost him a few years ago. Mm -hmm. um, during the pandemic, I did a thing where I read every Baldwin novel. I, was, I pretended that I had read all of Baldwin's work for a long time, and I hadn't. I apologize to the literary community for that. But I have now read all of Baldwin's novels uh, and everything, so that's why he appears in this poem. For Tyrone Givens. The paper said putting him in jail without his hearing aids was like putting him in a hole in the ground. There were no hymns for deaf boys. But who can tell we're deaf without speaking to us? Tyrone's name was misspelled in the HMP Pentonville prison system. Once I was handcuffed, shoved into a police van. I didn't hear the officer say why. I was saved by my friend's mother, who threw herself in the road and refused to let the van drive away. Who could have saved Tyrone? James Baldwin attempted suicide after each of his loves jumps from bridges or overdosed. He killed his characters, made them kill themselves. Rufus, Richard, black men who couldn't live like this. Tyrone, I won writing awards, bought new hearing aids and heard my name through the walls. I bought a signed Baldwin book. The man who sold it to me didn't know you, me or Baldwin. I feel I rescued it. I feel failed. Tyrone, 
The last time I saw you alive, I dropped my pen on the staircase. Didn't hear it fall, but you saw and ran down to get it. Handed it to me before disappearing, said, you might need this. Mm -hmm. Time for a poem? Is that time? Yeah, go for it. Answer your question. Um, Can poetry save? I think poetry can save, but also can illuminate Mm. what's been hidden. Mm -hmm. Dear future body, keep your skin thick. Yesterday my legs were propped in stirrups as the gyno said, you should go on The Biggest Loser. I heard cities at the skull base, stuttering over each other, vying in vows of your roles and that garden under your chin. The applied real estate of, don't you want to be beautiful? We have known the trap of nameless and hungry BMI indexes, dear God, in sample size fashion, escaping and caught in the same geography again and again, unmade and remade. I forget I am more than a house of red bones, of Vaseline and Werther's originals. Cassidy of a well-meaning, she has such a pretty face. I'm trying to tell you about a type of war. People carving the cavalry horses to survive, outline of social media models, and how many calories is this bottle of air? What can we eliminate? I always thought the planet Pluto was a black girl, now downgraded and mostly out. Dear future body, take a break today. Tell me, how are your kisses? Sometimes they give birth to promises, a season in the word, oil and oxygen at the ready. Are you someone's night's nice bloom? Remember to trace what remains, the prayers your mouth learns. I want us living, not just alive. Hmm. So that's the idea of capturing what beauty means, what love and yourself means, and how that's reflected into the world, how you inflect it into yourself. And so that point, poetry can save in that way. Hmm. I have so many thoughts. I don't know where to start. Um, I love that you ask this. Um, I write a lot about my family, and Mm -hmm. when I was growing up, I think, like many people, I thought that mine was the only weird family and everyone else's was normal, (laughs) but everyone's family has stuff, and I I think um, the reader that I keep in my mind is my younger self, Mm -hmm. and, uh, but I'm I'm not so bold as to think that uh, I'm, that writing is going to save, I, I didn't need to be saved. I needed to go through it. And mm-hmm. so I think that poetry provides a different type of logic to process. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what I appreciate about the poets that I return to. Um, and this morning, the words that were in my head or uh, the last lines of uh, June Jordan's poem about my rights, mm-hmm. which I return to constantly, mm-hmm. it's like a North Star to me. And uh, she says, my resistance, my daily and nightly self-determination may very well cost you your life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cost. So against. Mm -hmm. So I think of that when I think about what I'm writing against. And so. Mm -hmm. Y'all are so smart. Um, (laughs) We have about five minutes left. I want to know, want to open it up for audience questions. If anybody had a question, let us know. Yeah. She's coming with the mic. Yeah, she has the mic. Um, I really enjoyed hearing all of your work, and I teach um, creative writing classes to incarcerated teenagers, mm-hmm. and it's very hard to sometimes get across to them why poetry is important. What does it have to do with their situation, with the modern you know, world and circumstances. They think of poetry as written by old dead white men Mm -hmm. because that's what they've experienced in high school. Mm -hmm. If you were to give words of wisdom to that age group, because you all are closer to that age than I am now, what would you say in a few words or sentences to show the relevance to these um, teenagers? I think if you don't write about our joy, they think we're not human to deserve it. Writing about us, writing about the you, the I, and all our emotions makes us human enough to deserve it. So they see it, they'll believe it, 
when they come actualize it? I think for me, a big thing why I love poetry to call in response to myself is very meditative. Um, and to me, that is an act of love. And on a similar note to what Cynthia just said, sometimes we think we don't deserve things depending on mm -hmm. our situation, our upbringing. And I feel that it shows how much you can love both the outside world and yourself. So many things are full of questions. Love doesn't have to be full of questions. So mm -hmm. pushing that feeling of a purposeful love for yourself and what you can bring, how much love you can bring to the world, no matter where you are. I would like to ask the poets, when do you stop looking for the perfect word? You write a, <laughs> I, I assume you all do a first draft first and go back and wrestle with, is this the right word at the end of this sentence? And where do you, where do you say, okay, this is it? You don't stop. You don't. <laughs> I have crossed out words in my published book, so <laughs> it's a lifelong Ditto. struggle. <laughs> yep. But that's what keeps us going, right? Yeah. I think that's why we keep writing poems. Mm -hmm. I think my thing is like, my, uh, you know, even with the last book I just finished, um, I sent it to a friend of mine, and he said, what exactly, what exact free feedback do you want from me? I said, you know what, at this point, all I want you to say is you feel like you can see the progress from the last book. Mm. That's it. I just want this book to be different and more ambitious and more interesting than the last book. Because um, it's like a journey, right? And yeah. the, I, I've started to see books and poems as kind of landmarks and milestones um, through, like, like we said there about like passing through how we process uh, our lives, how it, the things that have happened to us and the world and others. I like what you said about the progression of the books because when I finished my first book, I thought, okay, now I have to write a better second book. <laughs> but then I changed my perspective. And you know those musical artists that they come up with a new sound for every yeah. album? Mm -hmm. I think I want to do that now. Yeah. That yeah. sounds really yeah. fun. Yeah. 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 You never stop searching for the perfect word. There is no perfect word. Yeah. You're continually growing, continually learning. Even going outside today, you'll hear... Have conversations. It'll be a word that you like. Like, ooh, that's a great word. You think about it and you write it down. It becomes part of your toolbox. So there will be a perfect word. Just being collecting more and more words to fill up your pages. Yeah. One more question, if you have it. Okay. If you if you don't, what's everyone's zodiac sign? <laughs> I'm a Gemini. Sachi. I'm a Scorpio sun, an Aries moon, and a Pisces rising. <laughs> I am a Virgo sun, Aquarius rising, Leo moon. Nice. I have no idea what that means. I only know what the Virgo Aquarius part means. Aquarius rising? Yeah. Okay, we'll talk after. Oh, God. <laughs> okay. Um, if we don't have any more questions, thank you so much. The, the authors will also be doing a signing in the tent outside. If you turn to the right. If you want to buy their books, you should. They'll sign it for you if you go to the tent. But thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thanks thank you. Well. Thank you.